friends welcome to the world of companies act 2013 yes my dear friends i professor kunal shah on behalf of jk shah classes is welcoming you all towards the journey of the revisionary lectures of companies act 2013 Yes my dear friends we have successfully revised up till now till chapter number 6 that was registration of charges wherein we have covered the provisions from section number 77 up to section number 87 of companies act 2013 yes my dear friends in this video we are going to revise the next chapter that is chapter number 7 of companies act 2013 chapter number 7 is about management and administration wherein this entire chapter will cover the provisions from section number 88 up to section number 122 of companies act 2013 This entire chapter is been divided into two different parts. Part A is about registers and returns, wherein we are going to cover section 88 up to section 95, and part B is about meetings, which is going to cover section 96 up to section number 122. So let us begin our journey for the very first provision of this chapter. that is section number 88 that is section number 88 section number 88 deals with register of members register of debenture holders and register of other security holders the law maker over here says that it is the duty of the company who shall maintain a register of members wherein the details of equity shareholders along with preference shareholders will be maintained by the company the law maker says that the company which is limited by shares the company which is limited by shares will have to maintain the register of members as per form number mgt1 however if you are a company which is not limited by shares then in that case the register of members of your company will comprise of the following details that is name of the member address of the member permanent account number or if it is an artificial person acting as a member then its corporate identification number details of nominee address of nominee the date when the person became the member of the company the date when his membership is going to get ceased and other or details which will be required by the company to be maintained for member to member if the company has issued a debenture or if the company has issued any other kind of security then yes the company will have to maintain a different register called as register for debenture holders and register for other security holders and such register should be maintained as per form number mgt2 the law maker says that whenever any kind of transfers are been approved by the board of the company then within 7 days from their approval the entry should be made inside the respective registers so the entries inside the respective registers should be made within 7 days from the approval of the transfers by the board of directors of the company sir which is the place where the registers will be maintained the law maker says generally the register will be maintained either at the registered office of the company or else it can be maintained at any other place but within the same city town or village where the registered office is situated however if you are going for option number 2 then in that case the company requires to first pass a special resolution by calling a general meeting however there is one more option wherein the law maker says that the company can maintain its register of members at any other place in india where more than one tenth of the total members are residing however even if you going for option number 3 then even in that case the company is required to pass a special resolution by calling a general meeting yes the register of members should be updated on timely basis it should be updated on timely basis 
law maker says if the company has got number of members which is lesser than 50 then index of names is not required index of names will be required only and only wherein the number of members are 50 or more than 50 however if 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 the company i have repeated this word more than three times because this is something which is optional so however if the company wants to maintain a register of member outside india it will be called as the foreign register of member but this is allowed only when it is authorized by the articles of the company it is authorized by the articles of the company at whichever foreign country you are going to maintain a foreign register of member the details of that place should be given to roc the details of that place should be given to roc within 30 days from the opening of such foreign register the details should be given under a form called as the details should be given under a form called as mgt3 if at all there is any kind of changes if at all there is any kind of changes in that foreign register of member i mean to say any kind of change of place of maintenance of such foreign register of members then even such changes should be intimated to roc through a form called as mgt3 through a form called as mgt3 see previously for example a company was maintaining a part of its register of member at a country called as america at a place called as new york but now the company has a plan to shift this foreign register of member to a place called as california then whatever such changes have been made towards the place of maintenance of such foreign register then even such things should be intimated to the roc over here whatever is the foreign register the company is maintaining with them that foreign register has to be assumed to be the part of the main register which has been maintained by the company so whatever is the format which has been adopted for maintenance of the main register the same format will be adopted for the maintenance of that foreign register any kind of changes inside the foreign register should also be intimated to the place where the principal registers are being maintained it should be intimated at the place where the principal register is being maintained however if the provision of section number 88 is not been followed then there used to be some kind of penalty however the penalties are now being changed and there is a new penalty as per the amendments issued by ICI through an RTP issued for inter CA December 2021 students. Now onwards the penalty upon the company will be rupees 3 lakhs and every officer of the company who is in default will be liable to pay a penalty of rupees 50,000. See any kind of offence under section number 88 will be considered to be a compoundable offence. It will be considered to be a compoundable offence. So yes my dear friends we have successfully understood the provisions of section number 88 which was about register of members along with register of debenture holders or register of other security holders. The next provision which we need to revise over here is the provision called as section number 89 which is about declaration in respect of beneficial interest in any shares. See, for example, Mr. X and Mr. Y. There are two people over here, Mr. X and Mr. Y. And there's a company over here called as Reliance Industries Limited. There's a company over here called as Reliance Industries Limited. The shares of this company is been held by Mr. Y. The shares of this company has been held by Mr. Y. So Y is been called over here as the registered member of reliance industries limited but there is some kind of an arrangement between x and y wherein as per the arrangement whatever is the benefits which reliance is going to give to mr y all those benefits are going to get transferred to mr x so mr x is however not to be considered as the registered member of the company but mr x is going to enjoy the benefits of the company then yes over here mr x will be considered as a beneficial owner mr x will be considered as a beneficial owner see during our regular lectures we have done a detailed understanding about section number 89 wherein when all such situation arises about beneficial ownership everything was been covered during our regular lectures 
But now, but now in the time of revision, we have to just revise the things. So X is the beneficial owner and Y is the registered member of the company. See, whenever I see a beneficial owner, he is the person whose name is not reflected inside the register of members, but he is going to enjoy the benefits. He is going to enjoy the benefits which is there upon the shares of the company. Over here, Mr. Y is the person who is the registered member, but he is not going to enjoy any kind of benefits which is going to arise out of the shares. Then in that case, under the provisions of section number 89, the lawmaker has clearly stated that the declarations of such kind of arrangement should be done to the company and the company will make such declarations to the ROC. Which means what? Why will have to make a declaration that however I am the registered owner of your company, but I am not going to derive any kind of benefits. Mr. Y will have to give the declaration about this activity to the company under a form called as MGT4. And such details should be given within 30 days. If there is any kind of changes, then even the changes should be intimated within 30 days. But if the company is a company to be considered as a specified IFSC public company, then instead of 30 days, the provision is of 60 days. So, Mr. Y, you are the registered owner, you need to give such kind of declarations to the company either within a period of 30 days or 60 days as the case may be, depending upon the type of company. Any kind of changes arising, even those changes should be intimated to the company within a time gap of 30 days or 60 days as the case may be. The declaration should be given under a form called as MGT4. Similar way, Mr. X, who is a beneficial owner, will have to give, will have to give his declaration to the company that however I am not the registered owner but I am enjoying the benefits from your company. Mr. X being a beneficial owner will also require to give his disclosures, his declarations to the company. And Mr. X will have to give his disclosures, his declarations under a form called as MGT5 within a period of 30 days or 60 days as the case may be. Once the declaration reaches to the company, once the declaration reaches to the company, the company will have to give such declarations to ROC under a form called as MGT6, under a form called as MGT6. If the declarations are not been made, then yes, there is a penalty. Yes, there is a penalty being imposed under section number 89. And what is the penalty? The previous penalty is now to be omitted and there is a new penalty. There is a new penalty which has been introduced. Lawmaker says that if you have not made any kind of declaration wherein you were bound to make the declaration under section number 89, but you fail to make such declaration, then in that case you will be liable to pay a penalty of 50,000 rupees. And in case of continuing failure, there will be a penalty of 200 rupees for each day during which the failure continues. However, the maximum penalty you can be asked to pay is rupees 5 lakhs over here. Lawmaker says that if the company who was having a duty to give the declaration to ROC under a form called as MGT6, the company who was having a duty to give the declaration to ROC under a form called as MGT6 and if the company makes a default, then in that case, the company as well as every officer who is in default shall be liable to a penalty of 1000 rupees for each day during which the failure continues, subject to a maximum penalty of 5 lakh rupees in case of a company and subject to a maximum penalty of 2 lakh rupees in case of officer in default, in case of officer in default. So yes, my dear friends, we have successfully revised even the provisions of section number 89. Now we have got the provisions towards section number 90, which is about significant beneficial ownership. Section number 90, which is about significant beneficial ownership. Which will be shortly referred as SBO, which will be shortly referred as SBO. See, the concept of SBO arises in case of a trust, in case of a trust or in case of a partnership or in case of any other institutes who are acting as a shareholder of the company, but the shares are not held by their own name. The shares are being held by someone other's name. The shares are being held by someone who is not in the benefits of the company. For example, there's a partnership firm over here who has got a significant beneficial interest inside the company. But the shares are not been held by the firm, the shares are been held by the partners. 
then yes it is the duty of the firm to report this thing to the reporting company that however the shares are been held by the partners but the benefits of those shares are been enjoyed by the firm as a whole the benefits are been enjoyed by the firm as a whole see when does the picture of significant beneficial ownership comes into picture it comes into picture whenever you are having whenever you are having a beneficial interest which is of at least 10% it used to be of 25% but now it is to be made it as 10% now it is to be made it as 10% so whenever you are holding any kind of beneficial interest which is of at least 10% then you are considered to be a significant beneficial owner it is your duty to make such declarations to the company and the company to whom you are giving such declarations is called as the reporting company over here the company shall maintain a separate register about such declarations given by the individuals and yes even if there is any kind of changes even those changes will be recorded inside this register yes this register will be kept open for inspection the register will be kept open for inspection any member of the company can inspect it by making some payment of nominal fees over here it is the duty of the reporting company to file a return of sbo with the roc it is the duty of the reporting company to file the returns of sbo with the roc however it is the company who shall take necessary steps to identify whether the person is an sbo or not for that case the company will give a notice the company will give a notice to such group of people or to such person whom the company believes to be an sbo or else the notice will be given to such any other person wherein the company thinks that that person knows that who is the sbo of the company the notice can even be served upon any sbo who was acting as an sbo at any time during the last three preceding financial years of the company whenever the notice is been showcased upon such person then it is the duty of such person to give information to the company within a period of 30 days however if the information is not been given or else the information given is not satisfactory by the company then in that case the company will directly apply to the tribunal the company will directly apply to the tribunal within 15 days from the expiry of that period of notice the tribunal will call the parties and given an equal opportunity of being heard and after giving opportunity of being heard the tribunal will pass necessary orders within a period of 60 days within a period of 60 days over here the tribunal may even ask the tribunal may even order that the rights upon the shares may be restricted the rights which are been attached to the shares may be restricted whosoever is agreed by the order of the tribunal can can approach the tribunal within a period of 1 year and ask the tribunal to lift the restrictions imposed to lift the restrictions imposed yes there was a penalty if the provisions of section number 90 is not been followed even in this case the penalties are being changed the penalties are being changed the law maker says that the person who was having a duty to make a declaration regarding sbo but the person defaulted in making a declaration then such person who is made a default in furnishing the declarations about the sbo shall be liable to a penalty of 50000 rupees and in case of continuing default 1000 rupees each day subject to a maximum penalty of rupees 2 lakhs however if the company had given you the notice stating that we know that you know who is the sbo kindly give us the detail of that person who is acting as an sbo but if you give any kind of false information to the company then yes you will be asked to pay a penalty as per section number 447 however it is the duty of the company to maintain separate register and to allow inspection for such registers of sbo and if the company makes a default in any kind of this provision then in that case the company shall be liable to a penalty of rupees 1 lakh and in case of continuing failure a penalty of 500 rupees for each day subject to a maximum penalty of 5 lakh rupees in fact every officer of company who is in default shall be liable to 25000 rupees and in case of continuing default 200 rupees for each day subject to a maximum penalty of 1 lakh rupees over here also the penalty is been amended the penalty is been amended 
so yes my dear friends you need to make necessary changes in your textbook as well you need to make necessary changes in your textbook as well the next provision is about section number 91 which tells about the power upon the company to close a register of members or to close the register of debenture holders or to close the register of other security holders yes see what is the logic behind closing the registers we have already understood that logic during our regular lectures so we are not focusing upon the logical part that why when does a company requires to close various registers over here we are just going to revise this material section number 91 says that a company has got a power to close its register for a period of 45 days in a year in one year the company can close its registers for a period of maximum 45 days but at a stretch at a stretch if the company wants to close their register it cannot be closed for a period exceeding 30 days at a stretch if you want to close the register you cannot close it for a period more than 30 days but if you are going to close the register in part 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 period then in that case you are allowed to close your register for maximum 45 days in a year whenever the company wants to close the register they need to give a public notice at least seven days before closing the register at least seven days before closing the register however if the provisions of section number 91 is not been followed then yes there is some kind of penalty the penalty says that it will be of rupees 5000 per day subject to a maximum penalty of rupees 1 lakh during which the register is to be kept closed so penalty will be rupees 5000 per day subject to a maximum penalty of rupees 1 lakh the next provision over here is about annual return that is section number 92 section number 92 over here over here annual return is a return which the company is bound to file with the roc there are few details which are required to be given under annual return See, if you are a one person company or you are a small company, then your annual return will be filed with ROC under a form called as MGT 7A. It will be filed under a form called as MGT 7A. There are various details which are required to be given under annual return. However, the details towards indebtedness is now to be omitted. Other details remains the same. Other details remains the same. Lawmaker says that the central government may prescribe an abridged form of annual return in case of one person company, small company or other class of companies which may be prescribed. So it is upon central government they might ask you to prepare an abridged return rather than giving a detailed return. And this happens in case of a one person company or a small company or any other class of company which may be prescribed from time to time. Sir, who will sign the annual return? The annual return will be signed by the director of the company and the company secretary. However, if the company does not have a company secretary, then it will be signed by a company secretary in practice. But if it is an annual return of a one person company, small company, private company, which is a startup, then the annual return of such company will be signed by the company secretary. However, if the company does not have a company secretary, then no need to approach company secretary in practice. You can get the signature by the director of the company itself. You can get the signature by the director of the company itself. The annual return should be attached to the board report as a summarized way, in a summarized way. The annual return should be submitted to ROC within 60 days from the date of concluding your annual general meeting. However, if the company had not called annual general meeting, then even in that case, the annual return should be filed with ROC within 60 days from the last date before which the annual general meeting should have been called. Generally, the last date of calling the annual general meeting will be 30th September. So if AGM is being called, annual return should be filed within 60 days from the conclusion of that AGM. If the AGM is not been called, then in that case, the annual return should be filed within 60 days from the last date of calling AGM, along with the reasons that why the company failed in calling an annual general meeting. However, if there is any kind of contravention in the provisions of annual return, then yes, there is a penalty to be imposed. The previous penalty is now to be omitted 
and the new penalty says that the company and every officer in default will be liable to a penalty of rupees 10,000. For the continuing one, it will be 100 rupees per day and subject to maximum of rupees 2 lakh in case of a company and 50,000 in case of a officer in default. However, if the company secretary in practice makes any kind of default towards this provision, then the company secretary will be asked to pay a penalty of rupees 2 lakh rupees. A penalty of rupees 2 lakh. So, yes, my dear friends, we have successfully revised our chapter number 7, part A. We have successfully revised our chapter number 7, part A. So, let us begin our chapter number 7, part B that is meetings yes my dear friends we are over here to revise a topic called as general meetings and not board meetings the concept of board meetings will be there at our final ca exams at our inter ca exams we need to focus upon general meetings yes General meetings are of two types. One is an annual general meeting and another is an extraordinary general meeting. Let us first revise the provisions towards annual general meeting. Section number 96, 97, 99 and section number 121. Section number 96, 97, 99 and section number 121 is going to get covered under this provisions of annual general meeting. The lawmaker over here says that every company, every company, every year, every company, every year shall call an annual general meeting. However, only and only a one person company is been exempted from calling an annual general meeting. Other than one person company, other than one person company, every company every year, every company every year shall call an annual general meeting. See, when I say year, so year over here stands for a calendar year which starts from 1st of January and it goes on till 31st of December. So for every calendar year, so for every calendar year, the company shall be calling an annual general meeting. It is the board of directors who have got the authority to call an annual general meeting. Annual general meeting has been called for the following two reasons. Reason number one, to safeguard the interest of shareholders. And reason number two, the ultimate control of the company should rest in the hands of the shareholders, which means at least once in a year, at least once in a year, the shareholders should meet up and review the working of the company done for the previous year. Over here, the first annual general meeting, the first annual general meeting should be called within nine months from the close of the first financial year. However, under any circumstances, extension is not allowed. Under any circumstances, extension is not allowed. So, the first AGM of the company should be called within the period of nine months from the close of financial year. If the first AGM has been called properly, then in the year in which the company was been incorporated, that is the calendar year in which the company was incorporated, in that year, if the company does not call an AGM, that is completely acceptable. So, the first AGM should be called within nine months from the close of the financial year. The subsequent annual general meetings should be called maximum within six months from the close of financial year. Yes, subsequent general meetings should be called on year-on-year -on -year basis. The gap between two AGM should not be exceeding 15 months. However, if the company is not in a position to call a subsequent AGM within a period of 6 months, then yes, extensions can be granted and extensions can be given only under some special reasons and the extensions can be given of maximum 3 months. The Department of Corporate Affairs have clearly have clearly said that if the company was not in a position to complete the audit 
of the annual accounts that does not means that it is the special reason in order to demand an extension of time limit no non completion of audit of annual accounts does not mean it is a special reason for demanding an extension of time limit for conducting annual general meeting in every annual general meeting the businesses which are going to get transacted it will be either be an ordinary business matter and it will be a special business matter if the following four informations or if the following four things are going to get discussed in the upcoming annual general meeting then it is an annual general meeting called for discussion of an ordinary business matter which means which means that there is a discussion towards adoption of accounts declaration of dividend appointment of director appointment of auditors etc but apart from this four circumstances apart from this four circumstances if any other matter is going to get discussed then such business matter is to be considered as a special business matter always and always remember in case of an extra ordinary general meeting the business matters are always and always been assumed to be a special business matter so on which day the company should hold its annual general meeting the lawmaker says annual general meeting can be held on any day except a national holiday it can be held on any day except a national holiday but for example if you called an annual general meeting which was not a national holiday but suddenly that day is getting announced as a national holiday then it is not the fault of the company if the company wants to continue the annual general meeting on that day it is still allowed it is still allowed however if the central government is satisfied by certain conditions if your company is fulfilling certain conditions and central government is satisfied then central government may exempt your company from the aforesaid provision sir annual general meeting should be called at what time the law maker says it should be called during business hours and business hours means between 9 am to 6 pm see the meeting should be called during business hours however the meeting can also get completed even after the business hours sir at which place the annual general meeting should be held generally annual general meeting should be held at the registered office of the company but if it is not possible to call an annual general meeting at the registered office then it can be called at any other place within the same city town or village where the registered office of the company is situated but when we talk about an unlisted company then in case of an unlisted company annual general meeting can be held at any place in india annual general meeting can be held at any place in india if the company makes a default in holding an annual general meeting then in that case then in that case any member of the company can apply to the tribunal can apply to the tribunal tribunal will give certain directions about that the company should call an annual general meeting the directions will also include that even if in that meeting if one single member is attending the meeting the company is still bound to continue with that annual general meeting the general meeting which has been called by the tribunal should be assumed to be an annual general meeting to be called by the company if the directions of the tribunal are not been fulfilled if the directions of the tribunal are not been fulfilled then in that case there is a penalty which will be imposed which will be a flat penalty of rupees 1 lakh however if the default continues then in that case for a further penalty there will be 5000 rupees per day there will be 5000 rupees per day over year over year if you are a listed company if you are a listed company then after calling an annual general meeting you need to go one more step ahead you need to go one more step ahead wherein the law maker says that a listed company needs to file the details of its annual general meeting to the roc under a form called as mgt 15 and such details should be filed within 30 days within 30 days of the conclusion of annual general meeting however if the details are not been filed however if the details are not been filed with the roc then in that case the listed company will be asked to pay a penalty of rupees 1 lakh plus 500 rupees per day if the default continues subject to a maximum penalty of 5 lakh rupees the officer in default will be asked to pay a penalty of rupees 25000 plus 500 rupees per day for the time when the default continues subject to a maximum penalty of rupees 1 lakh subject to a maximum penalty of rupees 1 lakh 
So yes, my dear friends, we have successfully revised our provisions towards annual general meeting. Let us revise the next concept of this chapter that is extraordinary general meeting. The concept of extraordinary general meeting is given under section number 98 and section number 100. See, any meeting which has been called on immediate basis or any meeting which has been called other than annual general meeting, those meetings are to be considered as extraordinary general meetings. In fact, any general meeting called between two annual general meetings. For example, if the company has already called an annual general meeting over here and the company is going to call an annual general meeting over here, so between, in between, any general meetings will be called, will be considered to be an extraordinary general meeting. Whatever are the business matters which are going to get discussed inside an extraordinary general meeting, it will be always and always assumed to be a special business matter. It is always and always going to be assumed to be a special business matter. EGM can be called by board of directors themselves, so motto stands for at their own motion or as per the request made by the members of the company, on receipt of request the board of directors will call the EGM, however if the board of directors fails to call the EGM as per the request made by the members, then in that case the requisitionist themselves, that is the members who had made a request will themselves call the EGM. EGM can also be called, EGM can also be called by NCLT, EGM can also be called by NCLT. So over here, over here, if the board of directors are themselves calling the EGM, then before calling the EGM, the board of directors needs to first call a board meeting. And if in that board meeting a board resolution was been passed that yes, it is necessary to call an EGM, then only the board of directors will call an EGM and it would be said to be called as per the directions by the board of directors themselves. That is, it is an EGM called by BOD on Sumoto that is at its own motion. EGM can also be called on requisition. That is, few members of the company will make a request. What do you mean by few members? If the company has got a share capital, then at least one tenth of the share capital, that is the paid up capital, will come together and make a request to the board of directors. However, if the company does not have a share capital, then one tenth of the total voting power will have to come together and make a request to the board of directors for calling an EGM. This requisitionist will have to deposit a written letter to the board of directors addressing it to the registered office of the company along with the matters which are required to be discussed for the upcoming EGM. This entire request will be signed by the persons who have made a request. The day when, the day when these people are requesting the board of directors to call the EGM, the day when their request was been deposited at the registered office of the company, from that day, within 21 days, the board of directors should proceed to call the EGM. However, it can also be called maximum within 45 days from the date of deposit of such requisition. If the board of directors does not call an EGM within 21 days or if the board of directors does not call an EGM within 45 days or if they are ready to call the EGM but for not the matters for which the EGM should have been called. For example, the members said that we want to call the EGM for all these purposes but the board of directors are not ready to discuss all those purposes in the EGM. They are just ready to discuss some part of the businesses. If any of the three situation arises, then we can firmly say that the board of directors have failed to call the EGM. And if the board of directors have failed to call the EGM, then in that case, the requisitionist will themselves call the EGM. If the requisitionist are themselves calling the EGM, then they should call the EGM maximum within three months from the date when the request was being made for which certain necessary rules are required to be followed. For example, it is the requisitionist who will send the notice to every members of the company. The list of members will be provided by the company to such requisitionist. Over here, over here, generally whenever a company sends a notice to the members for the general meeting, 
and if inside that general meeting some special business matters are going to get discussed then along with the notice an explanatory statement has to be attached but if the meeting is to be conducted by the requisitionist then in that case explanatory statements are not required to be attached if there is no quorum then generally the meeting gets adjourned but if the meeting has been called by requisitionist and in, in that meeting there is no quorum yes in that case the meeting stands cancelled and not adjourned the meeting would be cancelled generally no quorum meeting gets adjourned but if the meeting has been called by the requisitionist and if in that meeting there is no quorum then yes the meeting stands cancelled the meeting stands cancelled over here, over here, EGM can also be called by NCLT, for which NCLT will give directions to the company about how to call the EGM. NCLT might also give a direction that even if one single member is attending the meeting, then also the company is bound to call the EGM, the company will be bound to call the EGM. If the directions of NCLT are not been fulfilled, then a penalty will be levied as per section number 99, which we have already completed, which we have already completed along with annual general meeting. So yes, my dear friends, we have successfully revised the concepts towards annual general meeting as well as extraordinary general meeting. Now, let us revise the next topic of this chapter that is notice of the meeting. Section number 101 and section number 102 of Companies Act 2013. Section number 101 and section number 102 of Companies Act 2013 deals with the provisions of notice. The word notice is actually derived from a Latin term noticia which means to give knowledge. Whenever a company wants to hold a valid meeting it is the duty of the company to provide a proper notice to its members. Sir what do you mean by proper notice the lawmaker over here says the notice should be of at least 21 clear days. The notice should be of at least 21 clear days. When I say 21 clear days, it means the day when the notice was been sent, that day is to be excluded. The day when the meeting is to be held, even that day is to be excluded. That is the meaning of the word called as clear days. If the notice was been sent by post, then we also need to further exclude more 48 hours in order to a post to get travel from one place to another place. However, if the notice has been sent through electronic mails, then in that case, we don't need to exclude that another 48 hours. So, if the notice is sent by post, then clear days means those days wherein the day when the notice is sent is not to be counted, the day when the meeting is to be held not to be counted, and yes, 48 hours should also not be counted for the notice to travel from one place to another place. But if the notice was sent by electronic mails, then in that case, the day when the mail was sent is not to be counted and the day when the meeting is to be held is not to be counted. In case of a non-profit company, the notice should be of at least 14 clear days. The notice should be of at least 14 clear days. The lawmaker over here says, the lawmaker over here says that if by chance the company sends the notice which is of a shorter period, Generally not allowed, generally not allowed, but if in that meeting the members are giving their consent, that is at least, at least 95% or more of the members are giving their consent, then such short notice can be held allowed, can be held allowed. The lawmaker says, the lawmaker says that over here, over here, whenever the company is going to send the notice, the notice can be sent either through post or it can even be sent through electronic mode. If it has been sent through electronic mode, then yes, the company needs to adhere towards the provisions called as rule number 18, which we have successfully completed during our lectures. Sir, what are the contents of notice? What is the information given inside the notice? The contents given inside the notice will be about the place where the meeting is to be held, the day on which the meeting is to be held, the time of the meeting, the agenda of the meeting. All such details will be present inside the notice of the meeting itself. Over here, the lawmaker says that if, if, if the businesses are going to be a special business matters, if the company is going to transact a special business matter in an upcoming general meeting, then in that case, the company needs to attach an explanatory note along with the notice. 
so explanatory notes will be required only when in the upcoming general meeting the company is going to discuss some business matters which are special business matters sir what are special business matters they are business matters which are other than ordinary business matters sir what do you mean by ordinary business matters then so lawmaker says if any of the following four matters are going to get discussed then they are called as ordinary business matters that is for example consideration of accounts or declaration of dividend or appointment of directors or appointment and fixing the remunerations of auditors apart from this four situation any other situation is going to get discussed then such business matters are to be considered as special business matters and whenever there is a special business going to get discussed then along with the notice the company needs to attach an explanatory statement wherein the company will be explaining certain things to its members for which it becomes easy for the members to attend the meeting and pass the resolutions for that matters however if the company does not send an explanatory statement then yes there is a penalty for which the lawmaker says the penalty will be 50000 rupees or five times the amount of benefit the promoter or director or manager or any other kmp or their relatives have derived by not sending the explanatory notes whichever is higher so the penalty will be either 50000 or five times the benefits they have derived by not sending the explanatory notes whichever is higher the notice will be sent to every member of the company however if the member has died then the notice will be sent to its legal representative provided the shares are into the process of transmission but not yet transmitted the notice will also been sent to the auditors of the company directors of the company generally generally preference shareholders are also entitled to notice but preference shareholders will attend the meeting but they are not allowed to vote in the meeting which we have already discussed under section number 47 but there are very few matters for which a preference shareholder will be allowed to vote will be allowed to vote so over here over here over here the lawmaker says the notice should be sent to every member if the company accidentally omits someone to send the notice then it is allowed but if there was no such accidental omission and the meeting was been conducted then sorry to say the proceedings of that meeting would be considered to be invalid the proceedings of that meeting will be considered to be invalid so yes my dear friends we have completed one more topic called as notice of the general meeting the next topic which we need to revise over here is about the quorum quorum stands for minimum number of members personally present in a general meeting no sorry to say sorry to say proxies are not counted in quorum proxies are not counted in quorum see if there is no quorum na the meeting has to get adjourned option 1 it will be adjourned at the next week same day same time same place or else option 2 it can be adjourned at some another day another time another place as per the directions given by the board of directors however if the meeting was been called by the requisitionist and if in that meeting there was no quorum then the meeting shall get cancelled and not adjourned the meeting shall get cancelled and not adjourned in case of a private company in case of a private company the quorum required is two members personally present but in case of a public company the quorum depends upon the number of members the public company has got if the number of members are up to 1000 then the quorum required is five members personally present but if the number of members are more than 1000 but lesser than equal to 5000 then the quorum required is 15 members personally present however if the number of members are more than 5000 then the quorum required is 30 members personally present see generally a proxy is not counted in quorum but when i talk about a proxy of a artificial person that is a person who is representing a company in a general meeting of another company example there is a meeting called by reliance industries limited and one of the shareholder is tata sons ab tata sons is an artificial person they are not going to themselves attend the meeting tata sons have appointed a proxy then the proxy of a tata son proxy of an artificial person will be counted in quorum they will be allowed to speak they will also be allowed to have a vote by show of hands generally there are certain limitations upon a proxy but such limitations are not going to get applied in case of a proxy of an artificial person 
Similarly, if you are a proxy of a governor, that is a state governor or you are a proxy of a president of India, then even in that case, the limitations are not going to get applied upon such proxies. Over here, if the proxy is attending the meeting, he is allowed to attend the meeting, but he is not allowed to speak in the meeting. But if you are a proxy of an artificial person, if you are a proxy of a president of India or a proxy of a state governor, you are allowed to speak. In short, any other limitations which are applicable upon the proxy of a normal member, such limitations are not been applicable upon the proxies of an artificial person or the proxy of a president of India or the proxy of a state governor. Over here, if the quorum is not present, then in that case, the meeting will be stand adjourned for the next week at the same time, same place, same day. However, there can be another option, it can be adjourned for some another date, another time, another place as may be determined by the board of directors. But if the meeting was being called by a requisitionist and if there is no quorum, then sorry to say the meeting wouldn't get adjourned, the meeting will be cancelled, the meeting will be cancelled. Okay, sir, if the meeting has got adjourned, now for the adjourned meeting, does the company request to give again a notice to its members? Lawmaker says the notice can be published as an advertisement in a newspaper and the newspaper can be an English newspaper and a vernacular newspaper and such advertisement should be given at least three days before the meeting. Over here, even if in the adjourned meeting there is no quorum, then we have to wait for half an hour. Even after half an hour there is no quorum, then we can start the meeting with the number of members present in the meeting provided they are two or more, provided they are two or more members. Any resolution passed without a quorum, sorry to say, such resolutions will be considered to be invalid. Generally, a single member cannot constitute a quorum, but yes, there were four exceptional cases wherein a single member would be constituting a quorum. Generally, a single member does not constitute a quorum, but there are four exceptional cases wherein a single member will still be constituting a quorum and all these four exceptional cases we have already discussed in detail during our regular lectures. So yes, my dear friends, we have successfully revised the provisions towards quorum. Now let us move on ahead towards the next provision of this chapter that is proxies. Section number 105 of Companies Act 2013 deals with the provisions of proxies. See, the word proxy over here have got two different meanings. The very first meaning says that the person who is appointed on behalf of the member to attend the meeting and to vote in that meeting is called as a proxy. The second meaning of the word proxy over here is the document through which this agent has been appointed. So, if I am the member of a company called as Reliance Industries Limited, but due to certain unavoidable circumstances, I am not in a position to attend the general meeting of Reliance Industries Limited. So, over here, I am planning to appoint Mr. Sahil as my proxy. So, Sahil will be considered as my agent and I will be considered as his principal because Sahil is going to attend that meeting and he is going to vote in that meeting on my behalf. The document through which I am appointing Sahil as a proxy is also considered to be a proxy form, is also to be considered as a proxy form. The relationship between the member and the proxy is just like the relationship between the principal and agent, which means the entire relationship will be governed by the provisions of Indian Contract Act 1872. The next point over here says who has a right to appoint the proxy? The lawmaker says that if you are a member in a company having a share capital, you are a member in a company having a share capital, then in that case, you will be having a right to attend the meeting and you will be having a right to vote in that meeting, then only you will be having a right to appoint a proxy. But if you are a member in a company having no share capital, then in that case, your right to appoint proxy will be completely been governed by the articles of that company. 
sir is it necessary that the proxy should also be the member of the company normally the answer is no it is not necessary that the proxy should also be the member of the company but if you are talking about a non profit company if you are talking about a non profit company then in that case yes the person who is getting appointed as a proxy should also be the member of that non profit company over here the next concept says that the person who is acting as a proxy can simultaneously act as a proxy for maximum 50 members see whenever you are acting as a proxy for multiple members it is allowed but maximum 50 members however you cannot represent more than 10% of the total share capital of the company see when i say that kunal shah is the member of a company kunal shah is the member of the company so originally it is my right to attend the meeting and it is my right to vote in that meeting but instead of me instead of me mr sahil is going to attend the meeting and he is going to vote on my behalf however there are certain restrictions upon mr sahil to act as a proxy but over here we are understanding a different thing when i say mr sahil is a proxy of kunal shah to sahil simultaneously you can also act as a proxy for more 49 members now see one proxy at a time can represent maximum 50 members okay sahil have decided that he is going to act as a proxy only for me so if now kunal shah has got 10% of shares 20% of shares 30% of shares as the case may be there is no worries there is no worries sahil will be acting as a proxy for me because he is acting as a proxy only for me but if sahil has a plan to act as a proxy for multiple members then it is allowed but sahil you cannot represent more than 10% of the total share capital if you are acting as a proxy only for kunal shah then there is no such limits but if you are acting as a proxy for multiple members then yes you are not allowed to represent more than 10% of the total share capital whenever the company is going to send you the notice of general meeting along with that notice the company will also specify about your right to appoint the proxy over here over here if you are not in a position to attend the meeting then you can directly send your representative that is you can send your agent to attend the meeting on your behalf so it is not compulsory to appoint a proxy but if you want to appoint a proxy then you are allowed to appoint a proxy but always remember the details of your proxy should reach to the company at least 48 hours before the meeting the details of your proxy should reach to the company at least 48 hours before the meeting over here over here whenever you are appointing a proxy the appointment of a proxy should be in a written form it should be signed by the member of the company if there are joint members then it should be signed by all of them however if you have fulfilled all these provisions but your articles are demanding something different provision then you cannot question that the provisions are not been fulfilled just on the basis of your articles you can ignore your articles for the time being these are the three most important requirements for appointment of a proxy this is an important one what are the limitations of a proxy whenever you are acting as a proxy the very first limitations you have got over here is that you don't have a right to speak in the meeting a proxy is not allowed to speak in a meeting in fact if there is a voting to be conducted and if voting is to be demanded by poll then yes proxy can demand poll and proxy can also vote in case of poll but if the voting is to be done by show of hands then in that case a proxy is not allowed to vote in case of show of hands lawmaker says proxy is not going to be counted in quorum yes if you are a proxy you are not even allowed to inspect the proxies list with the company and you are also not allowed to inspect the minutes book of the general meeting so can a proxy inspect the proxies list the answer is no can a proxy inspect the minutes of the general meeting the answer is still a no the last provision under proxy is about revocation of proxy there are few methods through which the proxy gets revoked 
the very first method says by appointing a new proxy the appointment of the old proxy gets revoked but whosoever is the new proxy getting appointed his appointment should be his appointment should be done within a stipulated period of time that is at least 48 hours before the meeting revocation of proxy is also possible when the member who had appointed the proxy is himself attending the meeting and voting in that meeting or else revocation is also possible if the member who has appointed the proxy dies or he becomes insane or he has transferred his shares to another person so there are few reasons because of which a proxy could get revoked over here the last concept is about the inspection of proxies only and only a member of a company is allowed to inspect the proxies list howsoever if you are a proxy you are not allowed to inspect the proxies list if the member wants to inspect the proxies list they are allowed to inspect it beginning 24 hours before the commencement of the meeting but up to the conclusion of the meeting so proxies list can be inspected by the members just 24 hours before the meeting but up to the conclusion of the meeting so over here we have successfully completed the revisions of a topic called as proxy the next topic is about votings section number 106 up to section number 109 yes my dear friends all these four methods of voting along with the procedures we have done in depth during our regular lectures there is a procedure for voting by electronic means there is a procedure for voting by poll and there is a procedure for voting by postal ballots everything was been done in depth just let us have a quick recap when i say voting is to be done by show of hands the rule says one member one vote irrespective of the number of shares you have got over here when i say voting by electronic means then in that case the voting can be done even through a remote e-voting or it can also be done through an instant polls when i say voting is demanded by poll then the poll will be demanded by the chairman himself or the poll can also be demanded by the members as well as the proxy see whenever a voting has been demanded by poll the rule says one share one vote the rule says one share one vote voting by postal ballots is allowed only in the provisions which have been specified under section number 110 only for those provisions the voting by postal ballots can be done which is specified under section number 110 for those provisions voting by postal ballots it's mandatory however if your company is a one person company or your company has got number of members which is lesser than 200 then in that case the provisions for which voting by postal ballots were been announced can also be done through a voting by calling a general meetings see when you talk about electronic means when you talk about a poll or when you talk about postal ballots in all three of this situation appointment of scrutinizer is always and always required appointment of scrutinizer is always and always required so in my revision lecture i am not covering the procedural part about how the votings are to be conducted which we have already done during our regular lectures so yes my dear friends we have successfully completed the revisionary towards the aspect of votings wherein various things that is the various procedures towards votings were been covered the next point which we are going to cover is section number 114 which talks about ordinary resolution and special resolution which resolution is required to be passed when it has been predetermined by the lawmakers if the provision says that we need to pass an ordinary resolution we need to pass an ordinary resolution if the provision says we need to pass a special resolution we need to pass a special resolution see what's the difference between them when i say ordinary resolution it is a resolution which requires a simple majority which says the number of votes in favor should be more than the number of votes against it the number of votes in favor should be more than the number of votes against it when i say special resolution then it requires a special majority that is a majority of 75 percent or more that is a majority which is of 75 percent or more 
which means the number of votes in favor should be three times or more the number of votes against it. So which resolution is required to be passed when it has been predetermined by the law for which we need to follow the provisions of law itself. The next provision is section number 117 which tells about the registration of certain resolutions and agreements. Yes, my dear friends, there are certain resolutions and there are certain agreements which we need to register with ROC under a form called as MGT 14 and such registration should be done within 30 days. However, if you are a specified IFSC public company, then instead of 30 days, it will be of 60 days. Sir, which all resolutions, which all agreements we need to register with ROC. So the lawmaker says whenever a company passes a special resolution. Whenever a company passes a resolution which has been passed by all the members, that is a unanimous resolution. Lawmaker says any resolution which has been passed by the board of directors towards the appointment or reappointment of managing director or any kind of agreement executed towards appointment or reappointment of managing director. Yes, if the company has called a class meeting and in that class meeting any resolution or agreements which have been passed, then such resolutions and agreements should be registered with ROC. Any resolution which has been passed towards voluntary winding up of a company. Any resolution which has been passed towards subsection 3 of section number 179. All these resolutions and agreements should be submitted to ROC for registration and it should be done within 30 days of passing through a form called as MGT 14. However, if your company is a specified IFSC public company, then instead of 30 days, it will be of 60 days. However, in section number 117, there are certain amendments been put on. Over here in point number F, certain words have to be deleted and certain words have to be substituted. The lawmaker says that nothing of this provision will apply to a banking company who is giving loans or giving guarantees. So it is not applicable to a banking company, it is not applicable to an NBFC which has been registered under chapter number 3B of RBI Act and it is also not applicable upon any class of housing finance company which is registered under National Housing Bank Act. Over here, over here, last point says any other resolution or any other agreement which will be prescribed by lawmaker from time to time, then even such resolutions or agreements should also be registered with ROC. If the provisions of section number 117 are not been fulfilled, then there used to be a penalty which is now being changed. The penalty is now being changed and the revised penalty is as follows. The revised penalty is as follows. If the contravention is done by the company, then the company will be punishable with a fine of up to rupees 10,000 plus each day 100 rupees subject to a maximum penalty of rupees 2 lakhs. Every officer of the company who is in default, including the liquidator of the company, including the liquidator of the company, then they will be punishable with a fine of rupees 10,000 plus 100 rupees each day for the default getting continued subject to a maximum penalty of rupees 50,000. So yes, my dear friends, we have also revised the provisions of section number 117, which was about registration of certain resolutions and certain agreements with ROC. The last provision in this chapter, which we need to revise is the provision towards minutes. See, when I say minutes, minutes means recording of a meeting in a summarized way. It should have a fair and correct summary. Over here, for different, different types of meeting, different, different minutes book will be maintained by the company. If you are a member of a company, you are allowed to inspect the minutes of a general meeting, but you cannot demand the minutes of a board meeting. The lawmaker says that the minutes book should be prepared maximum within 30 days from the conclusion of the meeting. During the meeting, if the recording is done in a summarized way, in a rough way it is allowed. But the moment the meeting gets concluded from that day within 30 days, it should be under a fair and correct summary. Over here, over here, for different, different types of meeting, the company will be having a different, different minutes book. The minutes book should always and always been signed. The minutes book should always and always been signed. The lawmaker says each page of every minute book should be initialed or signed and the last page of the minutes book should be, should be dated and signed. 
See, if you're talking about a board meeting, then the minutes of a board meeting will be signed by the chairman of that board meeting. However, if it is not possible, then it can also be signed by the chairman of the next board meeting. But if you're talking about the minutes of a general meeting, then generally the minutes of a general meeting will be signed by the chairman of that general meeting. But if the chairman has died or has become incapable to enter into a contract, then the minutes can be signed by any director who is authorized by the board of director. If any resolution which was been passed by postal ballot, then even that resolution has to be entered inside the minutes book and it will be signed by the chairman of the board of directors. But if it is not possible to get it signed by the chairman of the board of directors within 30 days of passing of such resolution by postal ballots, then in that case, any director of the company can sign it on behalf of the board provided it is authorized by the board of directors. Over here inside the minutes, we need to provide the correct and fair summary. Any kind of appointments done during the meeting, it should be included inside the minutes. Over here, if you talk about the minutes of a board meeting or a committee of a board meeting, then the directors who are present in that meeting, their name should be included. And if any director who was not giving their consent for any kind of resolution, even their name should be included. Over here, over here, any kind of, any kind of defamatory statement passed against any person or anything which is irrelevant or immaterial or anything which is detrimental to the interest of the company then such information should not be recorded inside the minutes book it is purely the decision of the chairman to decide which all things should be included inside the minutes book and which all things should not be included inside the minutes book generally the minutes book will be preserved at the registered office of the company but however if the board of directors feels that they want to preserve it at some another place then yes it can also be preserved at some another place Generally, the minutes book will be, will be preserved for permanent basis and it will be under the custody of the company secretary or any director who is authorized by the board of directors. Any kind of tempering done with the minutes, any kind of mischief or any kind of tempering done with minutes is not allowed. If got caught, then in that case, you will be punishable with imprisonment for a term which may extend to two years plus you will be also asked to pay a penalty of rupees 25,000, but which may also extend to up to rupees 1 lakh. A member of a company is allowed to inspect the minutes book. In fact, you can also demand the copies of the minutes book. If you're demanding an inspection, it is free of cost. But if you wanted to get something called as a hard copy, then yes, it is chargeable. The fees can be determined by the articles of the company, which will say that the fees per page should not be exceeding rupees 10. The day when you demand a copy, the company shall provide you the copy within seven days from the day when you requested these copies. Over here, over here, if any kind of default has been made, then in that case, you can directly approach. You can directly approach to the tribunal. You can directly approach to the tribunal and the tribunal will guide the necessary orders and directions upon the company and its officers in default. So yes, my dear friends, we have successfully completed the revisionary part about a topic called as chapter number seven which was a slight big chapter as compared to other chapters we have divided this chapter into two parts that is part a was about the registers and returns and part b was about the general meetings i hope so you guys have enjoyed this entire revisionary lectures meet you soon for the next chapter that is chapter number eight declaration and payment of dividend thank you so much